Welcome back, Robin Kurz here, and this time around I want to show you some really cool advanced animation techniques with mFlare 2. After the previous episodes where I already used a flare preset and created a simple keyframe animation, and then set up my own custom flare and talked about some of the endless customization options, we're going to dig into the newly integrated Mocha Tracker for amazingly realistic flare animations with ridiculously few mouse clicks. To start things off, I'm back with my previous clip and custom flare that I've placed over the headlight of the car on the right, trying to match the actual flare of the headlight of the car on the left, with a few extras. Of course, if I use my mouse to skim through the clip in my timeline, it's pretty obvious that it needs to be animated to follow the actual path of the moving light. Of course, I could theoretically simply keyframe the position, but for anyone that has ever done that before, they'll know that that is not only tedious, but the results are generally less than stellar, let alone very convincing. That's actually something one in fact had to do with previous versions of mFlare. But that's where the last of these three buttons of our floating panel comes into play. The tracker button. Clicking it invokes the newly integrated Mocha Tracker. This is the same award-winning planar tracker that is available from Imagineer Systems for hundreds of dollars more. A planar tracker being a much more flexible and precise tracker than, for example, a point tracker, such as the one that is already built into Motion and other apps. A planar tracker doesn't look for an individual point to track in an image, but rather a pattern or surface. That means that with a single tracker, we can extract not only position data over time, but also scale and perspective data if you wanted to. Something that using a point tracker would require a minimum of two, if not four tracking points. So after clicking the tracker button, a couple of things happen. For one, two new buttons, track and clear, appear below my floating panel with a checkbox labeled reverse in between them. But in addition to that, my flare source point has turned into a box. The box, being the track region, also has a rotation handle on it, with which I can obviously rotate it if needed. And since this is, like I said, the actual tracker or track region, the reason that it has a rotation handle is because as a planar tracker, and not point tracker, it tracks an area or pattern in the image. That has the huge advantage that with just this one tracker, it can not only extrapolate position data of what it is I want to track, but also rotation and scale data. So I don't need to look just for a single point in the image to follow, but rather a pattern. That pattern can even change to a certain degree over time and the track still won't be lost, which is something that is practically impossible with a point tracker. If you have or have seen other motion BFX products such as M Sensor or M Callout, then you really see how incredibly powerful this tracker is since here we really only need position data for everything to look good. To select the area, I simply need to drag and rescale the box over the part of the image I want to track. What I like here is that the flare is deactivated while I drag, so as not to obscure the area I might be looking for. Nice touch. Obviously, the best spot to choose is the spot where the flare will ultimately end up as well, or at least something on the same plane as that spot. But more on that later. And since I know that the headlight isn't visible in the beginning, I'm going to start somewhere here in the middle of the clip. So after placing it over my headlight, I can now start tracking. For that, I simply click, surprise, surprise, my shiny new yellow track button in the floating palette. With that, a large window pops up, and after a short moment, I'm shown a big cutout of what is being tracked as it progresses through the frames, which are shown at the bottom right. This way, I can see how well my selection is being tracked as well as when the track fails if it does. In which case, I could just simply click the stop button at the bottom. Once it's done, the window closes, and if I skim through the clip past the point of the playhead, I can see that my flare has been tracked absolutely perfectly to the headline. And you'll notice that it even scales and rotates slightly. Of course, if I skim the clip before the playhead, the position doesn't match. That's where our reverse checkbox comes in. Starting at the exact same location in the clip from where I tracked forward, I can simply check reverse and click the track button once more. Again, the window opens, we see our track, and also see as it loses the track at some point because the light disappears behind the car in front of it. Once done, we can play the whole thing back and we see it switches over to tracking the car at some point. With that, our flare is even visible when the headlight isn't, which is of course not what we want. 
Skimming through the clip, I can see that the actual light disappears somewhere around the 108 mark. So since the tracking data before this point is essentially nonsense, I might as well delete it. For that, I just need to make sure my playhead is on the frame, from which point before or after I want to delete the track data, and click the clear button. A new window opens and gives me three options. I can delete the tracking data from this point forward, from this point backwards, or even the entire tracking data, which I would choose if I wanted to start over, for example. I want the data before this point deleted, so I'll click the second option and then OK. Now we see that the flare stays at the same point up until 108. But we have the obvious problem that the flare is visible the whole time, even before the headlight is even visible. So I could simply do what we did last time and keyframe the global brightness of my flare to essentially turn it off before this point, but we actually have a much easier and brilliant way of fixing this, namely with the brightness tracking. And using it is simple. You just need to go into the inspector to your flare settings, and the next to last point is what you're looking for. Click to show the animation parameters, and then flip open the track brightness. Flipping this open gets you an on off checkbox. If you click and activate it, four additional parameters appear. But with that, even before I change anything here, if I skim through my clip, we see that my flare already automatically disappears once the actual headlight also disappears behind the car. Pretty cool. What mFlare is basically doing is creating a high contrast matte or alpha channel from the luma or brightness values of the original image and using that as a guide for when the flare is visible and when it isn't. Seemingly simple, but so cool. So if, for example, I see that my flare is hitting a few light spots on the car earlier in the clip, causing the flare to appear and flicker, we can actually look at the mat by simply clicking the preview checkbox under the tracking brightness settings. This gives us a black and white image overlay where anything white that the flare intersects with will make it appear and anything black will make it disappear. Now, while using the threshold and softness parameters, we can adjust our mat to essentially tighten up the mat so that, for example, the smaller highlights and reflections on the car won't trigger the flare before the actual headlight comes into frame. Even if I move the flare across the image manually, we can see that it only appears in the areas that exceed the brightness level that I've set via the threshold and softness. Very nice. And next up, we want to go even deeper and look at some advanced animation techniques with the tracker and some of the other parameters, and then end with a look at mFlare in motion. So I hope you stick around. Thanks for watching, and check out the description for links and infos.